Write it down, you guys. Faith is seen from God's perspective. That's what faith is. Faith is a way of seeing. Did you know that? The Bible says faith, faith is a way of seeing. It's seen from God's perspective. Now, wouldn't you agree that there's always more than one way to see something? That's the problem. Any married people in the room know what I'm talking about. There's always more than one way to see something, right? He sees it one way, she sees it another way. You got kids, you know what I'm talking about. There's always different, sometimes there's like a dozen different ways that you can see any given situation, which presents a problem for us in our faith. And I'm calling them today, I'm calling them perspective problems. We have, we have perspective problems. Problems. So if you want to see breakthrough, you're going to have to get over these problems. Actually, it, these, these, I'm going to give you four perspective problems today. And these four things are actually stages of faith. Like your faith has to travel through and overcome these four obstacles in order for you to see breakthrough in your life. You guys ready for breakthrough? Yes. Amen. Let me give them to you. Let me give you the perspective problems. You may be caught in one of these today, but your faith will definitely have to follow through these stages. Here's number one. Write it down. And that is the first stage, invisibility. Invisibility. There's always an invisible stage of faith. There's always a stage of faith where it just, you cannot see it with the human eye. And this point is so huge because what we see determines what we think. And when we're asked to believe something, uh, to commit ourselves to something that requires us to abandon our sense of sight, it, it, it takes us to the very edge of our understanding. It's, it's like asking us to walk on water or to fly through the air, but I'm here to tell you that God exists out there on that very edge. It's that crossover point. It's the point of transformation. It's the point where you leave all human constraints and the human condition, and you undergo the shock of faith. God is always out there on that edge, beckoning us to believe, beckoning us to come into areas where you do not yet see. There's a story in the Old Testament of the prophet Elijah. A lot of you are familiar with Elijah, and I want you to, I want to use this to illustrate these perspective problems, the, the stages our faith must go through to see a breakthrough. And 1 Kings chapter 18 is where we're going to start, but let me set it up a little bit because it's important you understand the context of where we're reading. Right here in 1 Kings chapter 18, we're in the middle or at the end really of a drought. Israel is in a three and a half year drought. And it's not a drought like we've just experienced. And you guys still showering and drinking water and stuff like that. Back then when there was a drought, people died. Okay. There was famine. There was sickness. It was, it was a terrible time in Israel for three and a half years. And the reason why is, you probably heard of this name too, Queen Jezebel was taken over. And, and, and Jezebel was hunting down the prophets of God, killing the prophets. And she was turning, she turned the hearts of, of God's people to worship false gods. Their primary God was the false god Baal, and she set up her own false prophets of Baal, and she was killing off the real true prophets. So we're picking it up in, in chapter 18 where God told Elijah, I'm going to respond. Okay, the, I'm going I'm to end this drought, and I'm going to respond right now. That's where we're picking up in 1 Kings chapter 18. And it says, and Elijah said to Ahab, that's his servant, Ahab, go eat and drink, for there is a sound of heavy rain. I want you to note that because the rain hasn't come yet. Elijah's picking up on something. I want you to note that. There is a sound, he says, of heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. He's there praying. And he says, go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. And when he, he went up and looked, and he came back, and here's his report. There is nothing there. There's nothing. Now, I know what you sensed. You got goosebumps, Elijah. Good for you. I know, you know you're claiming it and stuff, but, but the reality is, I'm sorry to tell you, Elijah, there is nothing. This is the invisible stage of faith. Maybe you're in, today, maybe you're in the nothing stage. Maybe, maybe uh, you've been believing something and you can't see it yet. Maybe the doctor has told you that there's nothing we can do. Or maybe as a young child, you were told you'll never amount to nothing. You know, this church started in the nothing stage. It, 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 it started as a dream. It started in faith. It started in 
imagination. It's the invisibility stage, and it's kind of tough because you know what you heard, you know what you sensed, but sometimes what you see is in direct contradiction to what you sensed. I know what it feels like to be hearing something and seeing nothing. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know what it feels like to be hearing something from God, to like hear what the preacher's saying, to hear what the word of God, like I'm hearing it, I'm sensing it, but I'm not seeing it, God. I don't, and nothing's changing. You ever been there? I mean, no change. No change in your financial situation. No change in your marriage. No change in your kid's behavior. No, no new opportunities come available. But just because you can't see it doesn't mean God didn't speak it. Just because you cannot see it with your eye doesn't mean that God is not moving where you cannot see. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says that faith, what is faith, he says. It's the confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. And to be certain of the things we do not yet see. Accomplishing the impossible always starts with perceiving the invisible. This is the invisibility stage, and his servant is telling Elijah, hey, despite what you sensed, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. There's nothing. This is is a stage your faith has to go through. This is a perspective problem. I'm going to show you how Elijah responds. Let's pick it up in verse 44 now. It says, seven times Elijah said, go back. I want you to kind of, let me, can I just pause there and note that? You guys need to get the gravity of this. Seven times he's going to the ocean, like he's going to sea. His servant is running to the ocean to sea and coming back, and every time he's going, oh, sorry, Elijah, you're wrong. There's, there's nothing. Okay, go back. He comes back. There's nothing. Okay, go back. Okay, go back, go back. Go. This, is, this is what faith looks like a lot of times. This is the initial stage of faith where it's invisible and you see nothing. You say, I know what God said. Go back. Well, I know what God said. Go back seven times. Great faith looks like this at first. And so seven times. Then on the seventh time, he said, there is a cloud. Will you say those four words with me? Ready? Go. There is a cloud. There's some, okay, there's something now. It's not nothing anymore. It's something. But, but it ain't that big, Elijah. I mean, Diana, don't get your hopes up. Don't get your hopes up. I know you're hoping for like the end of the drought and stuff, but this is like, eh, it's just like a small hand, Elijah. It's, it's, so if you ever get past this stage of a perspective problem, the stage of your faith of invisibility, you're going to encounter this next stage, which is insignificance. See, I see something now, but it's really not that big a deal. It's insignificant. It's not, it's not really, you know. But great faith feels like nothing at first. It may even look like nothing at first. I remember when Discovery first started, and we would have one person get baptized. Who's been here for more than four years? Can I see anyone get amen in me? Yeah, yeah, you remember that? One person getting baptized. I remember on some Sundays, two visitors would show up. You got to learn to celebrate the seemingly insignificant starts. We would, we would celebrate the one baptism. We'd celebrate the two visitors. Look at uh, this next verse, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10. It says, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. This is significant. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Luke 16. Jesus says, if you're faithful in the little things, you'll be faithful in the large ones. He says, I can see that. I can see how you're responding to this. But if you're dishonest in the little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. What he's saying here, he's saying, if you treat the little things like they're insignificant, you're you're creating a pattern that won't be able to sustain the greater things I want to bring your way. This is insignificant. And if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches of heaven? And if you're not faithful with other people's things, who should, why should you be trusted with things of your own? Could it be that your perspective toward what God has given you in this season is preventing you from going to the next? I mean, you want a breakthrough, but your perspective towards the season you're in, this is insignificant. I mean, when am I going to catch my break? 
When am I going to do something of really important? When am I going to make, when, when, when is it going to be my shot? When am I going to get that? This, what I'm doing here is just insignificant. You're stuck in a stage of, you're, you got a perspective problem. This is significant is your confession today. And don't wait for it to seem significant before you start speaking it because that takes no faith at all. This today, right now, this is significant. And you know what? The devil won't like it when you start saying this is significant. Do you know that? Because the way he gets you to leave your assignment is it gets you to think that what you're working on right now doesn't matter. That's the way he gets you to give up, to leave your assignment telling you that this isn't you you don't see the significance of the small start of the little things of the small beginnings listen the devil can't keep god from making it rain but he can keep you from receiving it right down this next stage of our perspective problems and that is intimidation intimidation The enemy will try to intimidate you away from your breakthrough. The enemy will try to intimidate you away from the blessings of God. This is what happened to Elijah. Because Jezebel um, gets a report of what Elijah has done. And I'm not able to read the whole story, but I would love for you to go read Elijah 18 and 19. Right before and earlier in chapter 18, Elijah has a standoff with the prophets of Baal, with Jezebel's henchmen. 850 of them. It was mano y whatever 850 is in Spanish, you know, it was, it was, but it was one, it was just me against you, God, all of you, you pray to your God. He said, I'll pray to my God. We'll see whose God is real. And long story short here, he humiliated, devastated, and destroyed all 850. The fire from heaven came and consumed them. Well, Jezebel gets this report that she's been humiliated. Her prophets, her false prophets have been killed and destroyed. So she sends a word to Elijah. First Kings chapter 19 now. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me. If by this time tomorrow, I have not killed you just as you killed my prophets. Now pause right there. You would, you would think knowing Elijah, which you already know, Elijah's response, you'd think Elijah would be like, who are you talking to? You know what I mean? Like, do you, do you know me, you know? Do you, do you even know me? You know what I'm saying? He'd be like, I, I can say, you know where you can put your threats, all right? You know, you think Elijah would respond a different way because of who he is and what he's seen God do, but check it out. It says, Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. And he ran, he ran for 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he went in hiding. See, the enemy can't prevent God from blessing you, but he might be able to prevent you from receiving it. And Jezebel, Jezebel knows she can't kill Elijah. Jezebel knows she's no match for the man of God who has the power of God, the fire of God, who just killed 850 of her prophets. She knows that she is no match for this guy. No match, no match at all. So she knows she can't kill him, so she's trying to contain him. Hello? Do, do you know if the devil could kill you by now, he would have killed you? Do you know if the, if the devil could have prevented it from raining, he would have prevented it, prevented it from raining? Did you know that if the devil could have taken you out, you'd be out? But he can't, and he knows he can't. He knows he can't kill you, so he tries to contain you, so he intimidates you. And Elijah now is running from the very rain he prayed in. He's running from the breakthrough. He's running from the blessing of God running from it. And when you run from the battle, you run from the breakthrough. And some of you here today, you're running from your breakthrough. You're running from the rain. You're running from something that's already defeated. You're running from shame that God has already forgiven. You're running from situations that God has already worked out. You're running from an outcome that you don't need to fear anymore. Look, God's going to deal with Jezebel. You need to get up and start running towards the breakthrough again. Some of you are stuck here in this stage of intimidation, right, in, right as before you were on the precipice, and maybe it was situations or circumstance or the enemy himself that came in and started to put fear and intimidate you. If you ever get through that stage, here's the final stage that your faith has to go through. The final perspective problem is, write this down, imperfection. Imperfection. And I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about the situation 
or the circumstance, a little bit, I guess, yeah, the situation, circumstances, yeah, can, can kind of hold us from being, but really what I'm, what I'm talking about here is um, the way we see ourselves. This is a, per- we see ourselves for our shortcomings, we see our imperfections, we see our sin and our issues, and it's magnified in our minds, and it paralyzes us, but it's our perspective problem. It's not the reality. So this is what Elijah was dealing with in chapter 19, verse 4. He says, he's talking to God here. He says, I've had enough, Lord. I've had enough, God. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. It's a perspective problem because God's perspective, when you are in Christ, he sees something different than you see sometimes. See, he sees you as cleansed. He sees you as righteous, as holy, as redeemed. He sees you as his own child. He does not see you for your imperfections. Your issues are his sins. They're actually cast into the sea of forgetfulness. He don't even remember them no more. It's a perspective problem. And I pray that the eyes of your heart will be flooded with light so that you will be able to see the wonderful future that God has for those he's called, for his people. God brings his greatest miracles from imperfect situations. You know that? And God brings his greatest testimonies from imperfect people. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 4 says, if you wait for perfect conditions, if you wait for your issues to be all figured out, if you wait for for you to get it all just tucked in and right, if you just wait till you're all perfect and ready, you will never get anything done for God. Your faith will be stuck. You'll never see greater things. You'll never see breakthrough. You'll never see the hand of God move in your life if you're stuck waiting for a perfect condition, the power of perspective. You see, when you start seeing things the way God sees them, you walk in greater faith. And that's the power of perspective. It increases your faith for a breakthrough. Let me give you six things that will happen. When you see with the eyes of faith, when you can get over your perspective problems and start to walk in faith towards your breakthrough, this is what's going to happen. Here, write this down. Number one, the power of perspective. Faith shrinks my problems. God, I have the problem. I have an issue, but I'm trusting it with you, God, because nothing is impossible with you. Here, God, it's yours. I can relax now. I can take it easy. I don't have to be stressed out. My pro- Why? Because he's got it. My God has got it. Look what the Bible says, Genesis 18 and 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Ask yourself that question. Come on, is anything too hard for the Lord? The obvious answer is no. Nothing is. Look at Luke 1, Jesus says, for nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible. If you were to go to my home and my bookshelf and my library and you take off the dictionary, find the dictionary on the second shelf to the right, and you try to look up the word impossible, you're not going to find it in my dictionary. Five years ago, when we decided to start Discovery Church, I took impossible out of my dictionary. I said, God, if impossible is not in your vocabulary, it's not going to be in my vocabulary. You are the God of the impossible and nothing is too difficult for you. Faith shrinks my problems. Here's a second result when you start seeing with the eyes of faith. Number two, faith moves God to act on my behalf. Faith moves God to act. You know, faith moves the hand of God. Nothing else does. Nothing can move God except for faith. Now, I want to be kind of clear on something that you guys don't confuse what I'm saying here, because uh, the extreme of, of one theology is it makes God your caterer and your servant. I'm not saying that God's your genie. You get to rub the lamp and, 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 you know, put 50 cents in there and jackpot your way to like, no. There are some extreme forms of, of this theology that some, it actually makes it to where God is your servant. And that's, no, look, can I tell you something? God is not your servant. We are servants of God. But at the same time, I want you to know what Jesus says here in my, Matthew chapter 9, 29. Jesus says, according to what? According to what? According to your faith, Jesus says, it will be done to you. God says, you get to choose how much I bless your life. You get get to choose how much I bless your life. According to your faith, it will be done to you. Do you want to know why God has blessed discovery the way he's blessed discovery? It's not because we deserve it, because we don't. It's not because we're smarter, because we are not. It's not because um, we're better looking. Well, maybe we're better looking here at discovery, but... 
It's not, it, no, no. It's not because of any human condition at all. Listen, God has worked in my life and God has worked at discovery simply by because we humbly expect him to. We expect God, I expect God to use me and God does exactly what you expect him to do. According to your faith, it will be done to you. So if you expect God to do a little in your life, he'll do a little. If you expect God to do a lot in your life, he'll do a lot. If you expect God to not do anything in your life, he won't do anything. And that's why, you guys, I'm stretching you in this series. And even today, as I cast some vision with you, I'm going to stretch your faith so much beyond the borders of your reality. Because I, I, I don't want you to get satisfied swimming in a kiddie pool. I want you to put on your big boy trunks and jump into the deep end and grab hold of everything that God has for you. Faith moves God to act on my behalf. I have believed God for some really big things in my life, but it didn't start there. It started by developing the muscles of faith little by little by little. I, when I saw God, oh, he did that. That means he can do that. Oh, man, if God did that, he can do that. And little by little, I, I just keep pressing and pushing and stretching. And the Bible says, according to your faith, it will be done to you. God is moved when I say, God, I'm trusting in you. I'm expecting you, God, to keep your promise. You said in your word, and I'm declaring it to you, God. I expect you to move, which leads me to the third thing that happens when you start walking by faith. Write it down. Faith unlocks all the promises of God. This is the power of perspective for your breakthrough, you guys. Faith can unlock all the promises of God. We've talked about this a lot here at Discovery, but there are over 7,000 promises in the Bible. They're yours. You know that? Those are your promises. Look what the Bible has to say about, look what God has to say about all those 7,000 promises in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are all what? They are all what? They're all yes in Christ. Faith unlocks the promises of God. Now, let me just put it this way. Say you, got, you moved into a new house and the old tenant didn't clear everything out of the attic. You go up in the attic, you see a whole bunch of stuff. You find tucked away in one of the dressers an old letter. You get that old letter out, you open it up. And on that old letter, it says, the holder of this letter is entitled to $1 billion. How many of you like a letter like that, huh? Okay, but, but how many of you know that the letter does you no good at all if you don't know who wrote it? The letter does, does, does no good at all unless you know the author and the address. You see, the, the promises of God are to those who know the name of Jesus. All the promises are, yes, in Christ. When you know him personally, now you know the guarantor of all the promises of the scriptures, and faith unlocks them all, the power a perspective when you see with the eyes of faith. Write down number four. Faith turns God-given dreams into a reality. Faith turns God-given dreams into a reality. And this is, this is so important, you guys. Nothing happens until somebody starts dreaming. Nothing happens until someone starts imagining something that is not yet. Nothing, ha nothing happened Eli until El Elijah sensed something. He heard something before a rumble or a cloud ever appeared. You believe there was rain coming in the middle of a drought. And I want to challenge you to dream for your relationships, to dream for your marriage and your career and your kids and your ministry. I'm going to challenge us to dream together about the future of our church. And we can dream big because we serve a big God. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. This is my life verse right here. Glory be to God, who by his mighty power at work within us is able to do far more than we would ever dare ask or even dream of, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, infinitely beyond our desires, infinitely beyond our thoughts and our hopes. If there was ever a blank check verse in the Bible, this is it right here. This is your blank check verse in the Bible. He says God is able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask. So let me ask you, what are you afraid to ask God for? What are you afraid to ask God for? God is able to do far more than we could ever dream of. And I don't know about you, but I'm a pretty big dreamer. Does God do, still do miracles today? 
Absolutely he does. He's doing them in this church. He's doing them around the world. God is in the mountain moving business. Here's my question to you. What mountain needs to be moved in your life? What is the mountain that you've kind of, that you thought even to yourself, there's no way this can be moved. This has been here for so long and it ain't going to move, has never moved, will never move. And it's becoming the self-fulfilling prophecy in your life. How do you know that God may want to do a law of faith superseding the law of nature? He has in the past. He has in the present. He's done it all around the world. Faith opens the door for miracles. God is in the mountain moving business. Back in the story, you got to go read it. Please read it. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19. Because there in, in Elijah's cave of doubt, there in the middle of his perspective problems, God comes and speaks to him. And he, and he tells him, he tells Elijah, you got to read it, 1 Kings chapter 19. He tells Elijah, Elijah, go step out to the mouth of the cave because I'm about to pass by. Maybe you've heard this story. And then the Bible says that there was this great wind that broke the mountains. And it says, but God wasn't in the wind. And there was a great earthquake that shook the foundations of the earth, but God wasn't in the earthquake. Then there was a fire that consumed everything around him, but God wasn't in the fire. And then it says, then a still, small voice whispered to Elijah. Right there in the middle of his perspective problem, God was in the whisper. Maybe you're here today and you are caught in one of these perspective problems. Maybe you're caught right there in that stage of invisibility. And although you've sensed it, you've heard it, maybe you've been around church for a while, but because you didn't see nothing, it has caused you to doubt and stay in that stage to this very day, caught in a perspective problem. Maybe for you, it's, it's, that, it's that next stage where it looked insignificant. It looked small, and you treated it small because it looked small, and you're caught in your perspective problem. Maybe... Some of you have been intimidated by the enemy, intimidated by the size of the dream, intimidated by what the enemy started threatening you to do, to do to you. And that's caught you in a perspective problem. Maybe for some of you, you're caught in, in the perspective problem of your imperfections and you've just magnified, you basically disqualified yourself because of your issues and your, your hurts and your hangups and, and, your, and your imperfections. You're paralyzed there in your perspective problem. Well, God comes to Elijah in the middle of his perspective problem in the cave, and he whispers, check this out. This is what he says in the Bible. This is what he says. He says, Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you, what are you doing here? He's saying, God's saying, come on, Elijah, don't you know? Don't you remember who I am? Don't you know I'm the God of the impossible? Don't you know I'm faithful and I'm true? Don't you know the promises that I have given you? It's time to start running towards the rain. Get out of this cave. Get out of your perspective and start to walk again by faith. What are you doing here, Elijah? And some of you are hearing the whisper of God, and I want to challenge you to respond in faith today. Just like in these, in these series, in this six-week installment of Breakthrough, we've ended with the Breakthrough worship experience, and I don't want you to stir or try to transition at this time, because I'm going to challenge you to get your breakthrough today, to, to operate, to activate your faith, and start to operate in the power of perspective, to start to see things through the eyes of faith, and grab hold of your breakthrough today. So don't stir, I'm, I'm serious, don't, I don't want you to leave, I want you to grab hold of this church. Will you stand up with me, you guys? We're going to enter into worship again. And if you have faith to believe it, listen, if you have faith to believe it, I'm telling you today, there is a cloud. Come on, somebody. Do you have faith to see today that there is a cloud? That it, Maybe you can't see it with the natural eye, but in the invisible and by faith, I'm telling you, I can sense it like Elijah. I see